Hello and welcome everyone. In this lecture video, I would like to tackle a rather challenging theoretical text together with She Who Became the Sun, a 2021 novel and Hugo Award winner by Chinese-Australian genderqueer author Shelley Parker Chen. The text I'd like to discuss is Lee Edelman's No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, a text that has been described as one of the most challenging and shocking works of theory to have emerged in recent years by scholar Mark Fisher. The text is not just challenging in terms of what it proposes, but it's also a challenging read. And so I was by no means surprised that my students struggled with the text I myself had to struggle with the text to get behind the meaning of it. And so I would like to thank my students from the winter term 2023-2024 course on queerness in Australian literature for their insightful contributions to a discussion of Edelman's theory in context with Parker Chan's novel. So for this video, let's get started by getting to know the basics of Edelman's queer theory and the death drive. Consider this quote. For politics, however radical the means by which specific constituencies attempt to produce a more desirable social order, remains at its core conservative, insofar as it works to affirm a structure, to authenticate social order which it then intends to transmit to the future in the form of its inner child. That child remains the perpetual horizon of every acknowledged politics, the phantasmatic beneficiary of every political intervention. So here Edelman introduces this figure of the child, which we should not confuse with a real child, because it is rather an imaginary projection into the future. It is the idealized child that politics is made for. It's the child that represents the future. Edelman continues with this argument in saying, we are no more able to conceive of a politics without a fantasy of the future than we are able to conceive of a future without the figure of the child. That figural child alone embodies the citizen as an ideal, entitled to claim full rights to its future share in the nation's good, though always at the cost of limiting the rights real citizens are allowed. For the social order exists to preserve for this universalized subject, this phantasmatic child, a notional freedom more highly valued than the actuality of freedom itself, which might after all put at risk the child to whom such a freedom falls due. So the argument here is that by projecting all our future hopes and the politics of the future onto that imaginary child, rights are actually taken away from the already existing people, existing citizens. We can see this kind of argument today, especially in, in abortion discussions, where the embryo, even the imaginary embryo, takes precedence over the rights of the women who might carry it. So here Edelman already establishes why this future child can become a problem. And so Edelman sets up the argument that this death drive, the lack of a future, is not necessarily a bad thing. But we'll look at that in some more detail. The consequences of such an identification both of and with the child as the preeminent emblem of the motivating end the one endlessly postponed, of every political vision as a vision of futurity must weigh on any delineation of a queer oppositional politics. For the only queerness that queer sexualities could ever hope to signify would spring from their determined opposition to this underlying structure of the political. Their opposition, that is, to the governing fantasy of achieving symbolic closure through the marriage of identity to futurity in order to realize the social subject. Conservatives acknowledge this radical potential, which is also to say this radical threat of queerness more fully than liberals, for conservatism preemptively imagines the wholesale rupturing of the social fabric, whereas liberalism conservatively clings to a faith in its limitless elasticity. Quite a long quote, I know. <laughs> 
Now, Edelman is very careful not to say that um, queer people never engage in this futurity, in this imaginary child projection, because Edelman also says queer people do have children, and that's more and more frequent. However, queer people are not necessarily associated with reproductive futures, because they might not necessarily be able to have children. Now, conservatives take this aspect and see it as a threat, a threat to the fabric of society. Edelman, in a way, does this too. But Edelman says this is not a bad thing because the conservative society that is entirely focused on the future child consistently postpones the change, the, the good things to come into the future. It, it will never happen for actual citizens. The hope of a better future is always just around the corner, and it's for the children. This can also be seen when queer rights are taken away in order to protect imaginary children. For some reason, these future children are never queer themselves because they are idealized versions of what a heteronormative society imagines the future should be like. So Edelman advocates for embracing this accusation that, that conservatives um, hold against queer people, basically asking the question, do we dare to admit that queerness should and must redefine such notions as civil order through a rupturing of our foundational faith in the reproduction of futurity? So must queerness be the radical force that helps us stop focusing on an imaginary future child and instead try to create a better world in the here and now. Perhaps if there is no future, or at least no reproductive future, we will be more inclined to make a better society for the people that are here right now, for actual real citizens rather than for imaginary children. This can still refer to a hope for the future. But it's not a futurity that is tied to this phantasmatic child or to reproduction. It's a different kind of way of viewing the world. So what does this have to do with Chelly Parker Chan's She Who Became the Sun? Well, I would argue that the imaginary child, reproductive futures and a lack of futurity together with the queer death drive, can all be found throughout the novel. First, we'll start with the figure of the child, which in a way is central in the whole novel. After all, the novel begins with a child. A child with a small C, however, not the imaginary capital C child at the heart of politics as envisioned by Edelman. Instead, it is a child with no future. And in fact, it is one without the roundness that makes children adorable. So this child who will become the novel's protagonist, Jules, is directly juxtaposed to the idealized image of the child as not just adorable, but innocent and singularly worthy of protection. That child, the one with a capital C, in the novel's patriarchal society is always a male child. And the protagonist, the child who isn't adorable and isn't tied to the future, is well aware of that. If a family had a son and a daughter and two bites of food, who would waste one on a daughter? This is what the child, initially only called the girl, knows about the world. The girl knew that fathers and sons made the pattern of the family, as family made the pattern of the universe. So we can see here how a patriarchal and heteronormative society favours the family, within which reproduction happens, and their ideal version of the capital C child is the son. But when she tried to imagine the future, she couldn't. Of course not. She is a real child who can never live up to the ideal version of masculinity that her society privileges. We see this in particular when contrasting the girl with her brother, Zhu Chongba. Of course, he also is real, he is her brother, but he does have this imaginary future, 
future hopes are projected onto him. The village's fortune teller, for example, proclaims that Zhu Chongba has greatness within him, whereas the girl's fate is nothingness, or as she later realizes, death. Unwilling to accept this, however, the child takes on her brother's fate after his early death and is determined to achieve greatness for herself. This is in distinct opposition to her father's hope for the future. Her father delighted in her brother's future greatness. He saw this future greatness as a success for the family line, even though it does nothing at all to improve his own famine-stricken life. The girl, on the other hand, takes on her brother's name and determines to create a future for herself, determines to make life better for herself to escape the famine and poverty-stricken village. Now, throughout Ju's journey towards greatness, she is confronted with reproductive futurism, which she rejects, at first almost accidentally by entering a male monastery, but later explicitly and deliberately when she rejects being seen as a woman, she isn't one, and thus rejects being restricted by the expectations put on women in the name of reproductive futurism. We most clearly see this reproductive futurism that acts as restricting towards women via the character of Ma Zhu Ying. Ma's father had given her to the Guo family. She would marry little Guo, she would bear his children, and one day she would give her daughters to other men. That was how it would go. It was the pattern of the world. Here we have a repetition of the pattern of the world that we already saw at the beginning of the novel, the pattern of the world that is made by heteronormative society. She saw a vision of that awful pattern as rigid as a coffin. Marriage, children, duty. What room was there in it for her own desire? Ma truly exemplifies how this reproductive future can be suffocating. And indeed, she later escapes it through marriage with Zhu, who she cannot have children with. Still, Ma remains somewhat connected to this notion of the future child, for which she must care, as can be seen through her relationship to the Prince of Radiance. The Prince of Radiance is, in some ways, a phantasmatic capital C child. According to the Dharma Master, at the monastery where Zhu lives in the early parts of the novel, the reappearance of the Prince of Radiance, the material incarnation of light, would signal the beginning of a new era of peace and stability that would culminate in the descent from heaven of the Buddha who is to come. The Prince of Radiance is also the herald of the beginning of the new. His arrival meant a change was coming, something so monumental that it would leave the world transformed. But he is only a child. The novel tells us that he is a small child of seven or eight, encased in a crisp ruby gown that seemed to glow from within. His presence was ageless. His gaze, reaching them from behind the many strings of jade beads hanging from his head, was luminous. His smile is graceful and unbending as a statue's. Ma knew he was a real child. He breathed. But in the many months he had been with the red turbans, she had never so much as heard those beads click. So he is indeed a real child, but he is also representative of a future to come. He is an asset, not a person, capable of transferring authority to whoever is in possession of him. Ma, however, comes to see him as a real breathing child. On the other side of the bed, the Prince of Radiance smiled in his sleep. Almost involuntarily, Ma reached out and touched his smooth, warm cheek. It had been a long time since she'd slept in the same bed as a child. She was surprised at the power of her yearning to hold a little body. Ma goes on to imagine a future in which she and Zhu take care of the Prince of Radiance as their child, thus opting back into reproductive futurism. Not so Zhu, but we will get back to that later. First, I would like to turn to Zhu's adversaries at the court of the Prince of Henan. We'll have a look at this rather long interaction between the crown prince Yusun Tamur and his adoptive brother Wang Baozhang. You know it's true, Baozhang hissed. 
The only thing I could do to make myself less like the son he wants is to take a beautiful male lover and have the entire palace know he takes me nightly. Yusin winced. Though not unheard of amongst the Manji, there was little worth for a Mongol's reputation. He said uneasily, At your age, most men are already married. Has water leaked into your brain? I have no interest in men. Certainly less than you, keeping the company of those hero-worshipping warriors of yours for months on end. Men you've trained personally, shaped to your requirements. You'd only have to ask, and they'd willingly debase themselves for you. Bao Zhang's voice was cruel. Or don't you even have to ask? Ah, you still don't have any sons. Have you been so busy doing battle that your wives have forgotten what you look like? And oh, that general of yours is beautiful. Are you sure your love for him is only that of a fellow soldier? Never have I seen you fling yourself to your knees quicker than when our father was set on flaying him. Enough, Yusin shouted. He regretted it immediately. It was just his brother's usual game playing. He could feel a headache coming on. Your anger is at our father, not me. Bao Zhang gave him a brittle smile. Is it? As he stormed off, he heard his brother laughing. We see two things in this quarrel between the brothers. Queerness is seen as negative, and it is also clearly connected to a lack of children, or more precisely, a lack of male heirs. And yet, even Yusin Tamur's futurity, which contains imaginary children, is somewhat tainted by death. He had the sudden, eerie vision of someone doing this for him in the future. His children, then his grandchildren doing this for his children. His ancestral line with its accumulating dead. Always more who were dead than were alive at any moment to mourn them. Perhaps this shows that the reproductive futurity and the promise of fictional future children is not ultimately that positive, because it merely glosses over the accumulating dead of the past. Still, Yusin Tamur very much still ascribes to this notion of the future as inherently entangled with future children. The great Khan will reward us. I'll ask him to reward you with lands and a son you can adopt to carry your name. That's our future, don't you see? Our sons leading the great Yuan's armies together. They'll take Japan and Cham and Java for the glory of the empire, and men will remember their names the way they remember the great Khans. Here we can see how Yusin Tamur really projects his future success onto his children. When he imagines his future together with his general Ouyang, he doesn't necessarily picture himself and Ouyang having these successes, being happy, but he imagines their sons coming into glory. Now, Ouyang, the general he speaks to in this scene, is perceived as feminine and queer in a way, while also struggling against his own feelings for Yusin Tamur. Nonetheless, he is strongly devoted as well to the idea of the future child as the most important priority, despite the fact that such a futurity is permanently denied to him. Ouyang was the last son of his family. He was the last who would bear its name. Defiled and shamed, he lived and breathed for a single purpose, revenge. This was his future, to reclaim his honour and anticipation of its end was simultaneously the sweetest and most terrible feeling he had ever had. The terrible part of it brought out a self-loathing so deep that it flung him out of himself, not a human, but a contemptible shell, incapable of generating anything in the world except pain. Here he associates his inability to generate children with an inherent, perhaps, curse to only ever generate pain. And just like the child Zhu, Ouyang, deprived of the reproductive futurity that he thinks he ought to have, he cannot imagine a future without it. Looking ahead to the future, all he could see was grief. Zhu, however, is not content with a future that depends solely on the child, be it through her own reproductive system or through adoption of a child like the Prince of Radiance. 
her own future and success takes precedence. But even as the thought came to her, she knew she wouldn't give up greatness, not for a child's life, and not even to prevent the suffering of the people she loved and who loved her, because it was what she wanted. And so she kills the Prince of Radiance, eliminates the capital C child in favour of a fate she writes for herself. She lifted her arms and let the pure white light stream from her until their folded bodies were bathed in a brightness to rival that of the sun. From inside the coruscating aura of her own radiance, the spectacle of them was a vision of the future. It was the most beautiful thing Zhu had ever seen. Zhu's future is not dependent on an imaginary child, and certainly she is about to rip society apart. But of course she is far from an ideal queer person readers should aspire to. After all, her elimination of the phantasmatic capital C child coincides with the murder of a very real child, since we do learn in the novel that the Prince of Radiance is a living, breathing human being. Shelley Park Chen does not uphold Zhu as an exemplary figure whose queerness is associated with the death drive and the destruction of reproductive futurity solely in a positive way. She is instead an anti-hero, yet still one we sympathize with. I do find it interesting how Edelman's notions resonate within Parker Chen's novel and its explorations of various kinds of queerness. I hope this video has given you some food for thought and perhaps helped you to understand Edelman's No Future, Queer Theory and Death Drive a little better.